well of the last presentation. I hope you're all still awake. So, so yes, I said my name is Chris King. I have been looking into into techniques to trying to, pl to try placing and describing battles within the wider landscape. So, so that studies into the extended context of the battlefield and, of course, the features they have, have increased over recent years, and that includes that's not just that's not, as we've seen today. It includes sites outside of battlefield, battlefields themselves, areas around battlefields. Of course, the important part of this is trying to place what happened within the battlefield into the wider context, not only of the battlefield landscape itself, but into the wider context of the, of the conflict. Um, the techniques I'm hoping to show, I'm, ho I'm, sh I'm hoping to show, I will show them, I'll be showing here. Um, the aim was to, cr to create something to understand how people might have moved through the landscape, interacted with the landscape, but I, f I think that they can be applied to multiple other battles as well. And then I'm looking into the potential for these to apply to battlefields, not just in England, but elsewhere as well. So there are, of course, different approaches to understanding the battlefield landscape. This can range from the purely pragmatic of every, everyone, everyone march to the same place, everyone fire the same range, all the way up to, all the way up to more ritualistic and sort of trying, and trying to actually see the landscape and how people saw it at the time. In all cases, like I said before, this is to provide a, it's provide a model to understand the richer narrative on understanding battlefields and their and the wider landscapes. Um, and as and furthermore, the presentation here is based on techniques I have I have developed over the course of my PhD study. So these, sorry, I'm going to back it up a bit. There we go. So important to the important thing to say about these techniques, of course, they are based around how to place a, a, an army in the landscape itself. So, so a lot of people would base this on sort of like, well, looking at historical, looking at historical documents of where did they say they moved? Where did they say they fought? Some even in terms of artifact scatter, trying to find exact, exactly where people shot and other elements like that. But what these techniques try to do is trying to almost, almost try and do it from the ground up. So using the following techniques, exactly how much room do people take up in the landscape? So literally, if you have, if you have 10,000 people sitting in a field, how big is that? It, and the answer is not, not big when you look at when it compared to a battlefield. Also, what could be seen by someone within this landscape? So, the, so essentially, of course, do, if, you, if you're saying that this person might be able to see the battlefield and be able to actually affect the battlefield from where, the, from where historically they're said to have been standing, do we actually know they could have seen anything? Would they have had to have been on horseback to actually see the whole of the battlefield? And then, of course, in, in, and then also illustrating potential routes of movement through within the landscape itself. So trying to indicate where, if given ideal circumstances, you would be naturally drawn to move in the landscape. And of course, indicating the effective range of weapons. These are um, indicate the effective range of weapons in the landscape. So trying to show, if you were trying to shoot someone with an arrow or a bullet, exactly how close would you, in theory, have to get for that to be possible? Effectively, they boil down to these four things. So you've got presence in the landscape, perfect perspective on the landscape, interaction with the landscape, and action in the landscape. And as you can possibly guess, um, well, these, of course, are designed to represent the varied ways in which an army interacts with the landscape. And fundamentally, these, these results must be interpreted. These are, not, these, are, these are not absolute things, so arrows don't vanish after, they, after 200 yards. They do something else. But it does, give a, does fundamentally give an interesting model on analysing the landscape. As you might have guessed, and I think this slide should have been a bit earlier, um, these are based within geographic information systems. So... They are these are techniques I've developed within the system itself, within the computer system, and they are they are as uh, some of you here may be probably quite familiar with GIS. They are it's designed to work with spatial data that you ask, so you can answer, essentially answer more questions by layering data on top of itself. So in this case, all of the techniques I have just I have just mentioned are actually placed within the within the landscape in GIS within the maps, and. By combining all these different types of techniques, we hope, well, I hope, to get a different idea, a different perspective on the landscape and the, and the battle that took place within it. As I said before, these are fundamentally not um, absolute. They must be interpreted with additional sources, like we've been saying all the way through this, like we've been saying all the way through this, this, um, this session. 
without other aspects of without other aspects of the historical historical record and the on the archaeological record, we can't say everything about a battlefield. They, it must be combined. But they do serve to enrich the representation of a battlefield in terms of understanding how people might have moved within it, how people might have seen it actually from their own perspectives. So what follows is a case study from my own um, PhD and there's an ongoing project with a colleague of mine, Eleanor Bennett, for applying these techniques to a battlefield in the, in, in the Middle East, which has little or no information about it. So first example, the first example is the Battle of Bloor Heath. If you're unfamiliar with it, it took place during the Wars of the Roses, a, um, is a dynastic struggle in the 15th century, in the late 15th century in Britain. And this is what we, this is why I normally call a unit size analysis. This is literally taking, based on the assumption that people take up, you know, roughly square amounts of room in the landscape. These, these are the unit size, these are the estimated unit sizes for groups of people within the landscape, matching the number of people that historical sources say actually fought in the landscape. And what surprises me, certainly from this point, is how little room they actually take up. This is, not a very, this is not a very large battlefield, as you can see, but even so, people, sort of people, people taking up about a metre square each, they are not, it doesn't vastly fill up the landscape, so there's still room to manoeuvre around everybody. This is the least cost path, this is the least cost path analysis, indicating, in theory, based on topography alone, where would you move in the landscape? And as you see, naturally, there is a, there's a name for roughly where the modern road is, funny about that. But the topographical map does not take into account the location of the road. This is wholly based on the topography. So quite possibly, maybe, they, maybe the road was built there because it was a natural dip point in the landscape. But it does what thing it does demonstrate is that attacking head on across this river in the center of the, land, when it's in the center of battlefield is actually quite hard, at least according to the analysis. This is visibility from the point of view of the Yorkists, this army here, the ones who won. But despite the fact they won the one, they can't see, they can only see about a third of the army facing them, at least based on these locations. This is compared to their opponents, who've got a very have got much larger visibility within the landscape. Of course, as I said before, this does require additional interpretation. Just because they can see the enemy, what does that mean? Fantastic, they can see them. What do they do? What, what do they do with that information? And what that is demonstrating is the effective range of a longbow from the positions of the Yorkists. And what you can tell is it's really not that far. But also, potentially, they might have been using the river as a, as a point to shoot at, quite possibly, from this point. We know from historical source material that they didn't start shooting until they actually crossed, until the Lancastrians crossed the river with cavalry. No, we don't know why. Um, but it means that despite the fact that these guys are obviously on the high ground. They have to get off it to actually get anywhere near shooting their opponents with arrows or engaging them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So at the very least, that is, a, that is an interesting thought on the landscapes of why, why, what's the point of standing up there if the only advantage it gives you is to look down, is to look down on your enemy or potentially sort of scare them because they'll spot you up on the hill. So after all that, what are these actually for? What are these actually accomplishing? So. In indications that definitely the, the battle would have been influenced by the landscape that it sits in. I mean, that sounds obvious to state, but proving, but at least demonstrating that in this way is quite important. So, for example, one side was quite one one site could one side could quite clearly see more than the others. In fact, actually, I might just skip that bit. There we go. So the armies do actually fit within the battlefield landscape. So one thing that was, one thing that was demonstrated to me in from my own research is that some people are basing how many people fought, fought in the landscape or how many people that could roughly fit in a field. And at least from my analysis, it seems that you can fit quite a lot of people in a field. Um, the topography seems to pull people towards a single course across the, across the river, at least from my own initial, you know, initial um, analysis. One force had significantly more visibility than the other within the landscape. Now, what does that mean for these armies? There is suggestion that it could literally be intimidation, that being able to see the opponent across, uh, <laughs> across the part of the landscape is actually quite scary for your opponents, but also it's, it's dominating for one side. But also you can potentially plan the battle a bit better. And also that the weapons, the ranged weapons used by each other and the close combat weapons, of course, will necessitate much closer time to engage. 
Bearing in mind this this battle took place in the 15th century, so um, there were use of early early artillery, but not very effective. They'd still be closing to hand-to-hand -hand combat and use of arrows. So that is what they can tell. That's what you can tell us about a battlefield that has a relatively large amount of information. So what can what can it tell us about other battlefields in the landscape? So. As I said before, this is going to be applied to another battlefield example where we know relatively little. All we know is that it took place, it, it took place during the time of, I'm very sorry, Ellie, if I pronounce this wrong, Tilgeth Plesler III, an, an Assyrian king, and one of the queens of the Arabs. So you see, that is the, that is the battlefield, again, using, an, using a size-based analysis. If everyone taking up a certain amount of room in the landscape, these are infantry, believe it or not. Those are chariots, those purple down there. Those are large groups of herding animals. And one of the questions that my colleague was trying to find out is, that, again, would they fit within the landscape? And the answer is yes. That is the, that's the landscape feature that was presumed to be the location of the battle, and that's how much room they take up. It is absolutely minuscule. Um, another, another assumption was, how the heck did they get up there? And from this information, it suggests that Possibly this one, this this route here, because it's because there are some of the some of the uh, least cost paths actually converge a little bit in this area, but also it is actually a lot rougher up in this 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 area of the plateau. And another element that was being analysed by by my colleague was, could people see from the centre from the centre of this landscape out? And the reason I've only put one of these up here, we did about like about twenty facing different directions. This is the only one that could see anything. It's the only one that can see anything of the wider landscape. All the rest, like pretty much down until you get down onto the flat area of land around it, they couldn't see anything at all. So, as I said by the way, what does this say about the battlefield that we didn't know before? So, the techniques were applied to this battlefield. It was trying to determine, could it have taken place in this area of the landscape? Yes, it could have done, as far as my colleague was concerned, in her knowledge of the secondary source material. These techniques provide additional information on how the battle may have taken place, and it demonstrates that these techniques can be applied to other battlefields, especially in situations where they may not know much about it, especially in these situations. So number of personnel present, do you want to know how much, how much a Roman army takes up in the field? Could different, could different parts of the battlefield have battle been actually separated from each other by visibility? And what features in the landscape would have actually proved important. So like the river in the first example, or the hill in the first example, or indeed the gigantic plateau in the second example. As I've been going on for a little while now, the interpretation of subject matter is fundamentally subjective. All, of, all this tells us, it gives you an idea, it, force, it, it means you can ask another question about the battlefield that may not have been asked before. The, this, is, this is important because as we've quite rightly been discussing, so what is the importance of a battlefield? But unfortunately, the people who are fighting on the battlefield is always important because the fundamentally might be dying there. So trying to get from their perspective is, fun is, is, fan is fantastically important. Also, by combining the known data, by combining where people think they were in the landscape and what the physical landscape now can tell us about the battlefield and how people could have, in could have interacted with it, it can fundamentally either provide significant new information on the battlefield itself or about the combatants involved in it. And as I said, even understanding the space taken up by soldiers can provide vital understanding. So this highlights, hopefully, the potential benefits of sharing these techniques across borders because one thing that my colleague is saying is they know nothing about this battle from between the Assyrian king and the Arab queen. They know literally nothing. So everything, everything I've been showing you here is a bonus for her because she knows nothing about that battle. The battle for me within, the battle for me with Bloor Heath, that's, that provides lots more, lots, lots more information or potentially lots more information about a battle that we already know quite a lot about. But it also is also important because as has been highlighted to me over the course of my research, the, the focusing on our own little battles on our own little, our own little conflicts means that we don't, get a chance to spread these techniques and spread these approaches across different battlefields, different time periods. And from me just sharing this one element of my PhD has actually helped one other person in another discipline potentially make a whole other section of her, of her, of, of her subject more available to others. Thank you very much.